on Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. We're back for episode 180. That feels like a pretty cool milestone for D1 Rejects. I think potentially even a cooler one is the fact that uh, as of tonight, as I'm recording this Monday, October 7th, almost slipped up there, we hit 10,000 followers on Instagram. We've officially eclipsed that mark, and I am uh, pretty grateful that there are 10,000 individuals that at least thought it was worthy enough to hit the follow button. That's a pretty cool deal. So if you aren't one of those 10,000, please go over to the Instagram at Division One Rejects. That's the number one inside of Division One Rejects. Go over there and hit that follow. Make it uh, 10,001. I would appreciate you very much. But otherwise, we've got a great episode. The night of October 7th, we will be joined by the wide receiver from University of Wisconsin-Platteville. That's Brant Stair, who you saw us post earlier in the week. This dude was on the throwing end of a game-winning double pass in overtime against a top-five-ranked lacrosse squad. I'm really excited to talk to him and the Pioneers over there. I do believe it's the first time we've had representation from the Pioneers over there in the YX. So excited about that conversation. Otherwise, later on in the show, Jason Tommy joins me. He's a defensive back from the uh, Colorado Mesa Mavs over there. The Mavericks with a big-time win over the Colorado School of Mines. Mines handed their first RMAC conference loss in over a 1,000 days at the hands of the Mavs, who bring home some pretty cool hardware. So excited to talk to Jason and Brant, Jimmy Martin, Matt Schwarzler, back in the saddle with me tonight. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. A lot of great things going on when it comes to D1 Rejects. Let's start things off, though, with something not D1R related, even though maybe we wish we would like it to be. Our tweet of the week comes from one of our good friends over at D2Football.com, that being Chuck Bittner, the national columnist. He tweets here, it's halftime at the Black Hills Brawl. South Dakota Mines leads Black Hills State 7-3. A Mandalorian in striped overalls is going to attempt a kick to win a prize. Incredible. And if you're listening, you, you got a picture. I would actually, I think it's cooler to just envision that in your head, what the hell that looks like. If you're watching on YouTube, it's pretty spectacular. You also got to know it is not appropriate weather to be wearing overalls with nothing underneath it. That man is turning red and or purple by the looks of things, but uh, this certainly is the way. And from one Star Wars guy to another, I will say, Chuck, I don't believe that's actually a Mandalorian helmet. We might have to get you straight on your Star Wars knowledge from this angle. It looks like maybe Captain Wolf. Was it the 212th? I don't know. I'm going to geek out here Star Wars-wise. I think that's a Captain Wolf helmet. May have to contact this guy and see if uh, I can confirm or deny that claim. But we can keep moving forward. Let's start with our first guest conversation of the night. Bring it on the man, Brant Stare. Join the show tonight. This man had almost 200 receiving yards to go with what was a perfect passer rating this weekend. He was also on the delivering end of a game-winning double pass for the Pioneers. Brant Stare, what's going on, man? What's going on? Thanks for having me. Dude, excited to get you on here. It felt like, uh, you know, I told your coach this morning, I'd be stupid if I had anyone else sitting in your chair right now talking to me on this show. That was a ridiculous finish on Saturday. Talk me through that one. Did you guys know that that was going to be something you were going to as soon as you went to overtime? Yeah, um, it just, the situation happened how it did, and um, we got the ball, and that was the play. Our coach got it in, and there was no hesitation with it got it in, ran it, and executed. See, you make that all sound, like, incredibly simple, and I think that's what you're supposed to say, you know, because you, you obviously have trust, one, in yourself to uh, first catch the ball, obviously, yeah. and then, two, to go and deliver a dot downfield, right? That's another part of this that is uh, certainly impressive. <laughs> you also have trust in the guys around you, your quarterback to deliver, and then the guy on the receiving end to actually go make the play, quote-unquote, in the end zone. But when we watch this clip man of this play it was anything but simple uh and i think that's just something right, I, wanted one to, left, I wanted to highlight talking about this thing man uh was that something you guys implemented maybe at the beginning of the season were you holding on to this was that, was that something that went in this week into the game plan no we've had that um we've had that play and, and we've repped it um of course there's a lot of moving parts with it but um it's just really a testament to like you said it takes a lot of trust um, with all the guys and all the moving parts, but, um, you know, we all trust each other and we are able to get it done. So now you're three for six on your career passing. You know that off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, I think, I think the numbers are a little off there. But, okay. Explain, um, please explain. I, I, I believe I'm, I believe I'm two for three. Okay. Um, I threw two passes last season. One was incomplete. One was complete. 
um, and then one so far. This so they've year. got you in the box score with a pick last year. Did you throw an interception or is no, that? She, no, I did not throw an interception. <laughs> That we got to get that cleared up, huh? We cannot have that uh, on your record. Which otherwise, like you said, if, if it is as you claim, that's pretty damn good, dude. But now you throw an interception in there, and and now my yeah. perfect passer rating comment <laughs> kind of goes out the window. Yeah, yeah that's all right. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get that sorted. But uh, let's backtrack. Talk about the game as a whole for you guys. And for me, just watching and going through some clips and not being able to maybe watch the thing from start to finish, you guys took some shots down the field offensively, right? And really took the top off that Eagle secondary. You had three touchdowns of 40-plus yards. That's something that stands out for me right away. Was that one of the goals going into this one, something you identified you might be able to do against that defense? Well, I think it's just something that we're able to do offensively with yep. the pieces that we have. Um, I think we're able to attack all three levels on the field. And... Um, that's that's just how it happened during the game um and that's certainly something that we'll continue to do moving forward and continue to try to attack all three levels amen amen absolutely and when you talk about a stat that is uh, maybe a little bit crazy in terms of box score and what is usually a very bad indicator of a football team's performance that being your time of possession you guys possess the ball for less than 23 minutes which usually given no other contextual clues about the way this game went and proceeded throughout the four quarters that usually means a team did not do very well you guys were very much the exception to that one only had one true trip to the red zone too which is kind of ridiculous but like we talked about most of those plays you guys are scoring out are those long uh, yardage plays down the field how did the defense hold though uh, up though excuse me on the other side of things because when you possess the ball for 23 minutes that means the other teams out there are a hell of a lot more often so how did that defense hold up to being on the field for I mean more than a majority of the game yeah definitely huge credit to our defense um they were able to slow their offense down um, a ton, and our offense was struggling a little bit early, but uh, we we had to rely on our defense a lot. We put a lot of pressure on those guys. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't want it to happen that way, but, you know, they, they held up their end of the bargain and then some um, played a really great game. Like the motto on that side of the ball is fast, physical, together, and they they definitely showed that. Yeah, they live it, dude. And by the way, your offense, not the only one struggling in the first quarter, at least, I mean, early on, both teams account for a combined total of 16, or excuse me, that would have been even more ridiculous, 60-6-0 yards of offense, which in itself is a ridiculous number, especially when you talk about two offenses that have not struggled uh, into that effect, right, in the course of this season and even last year. What the hell happened between quarter one and two? Did we flip a switch on the sideline before we started up the next series? What do you kind of, you know, amount that up to? I think, you know, just throughout the game, you're constantly making adjustments and stuff and trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. And I think it's just one of those things where some adjustments were made correctly. And, um, you know, you just try to keep figuring it, figuring it out throughout the game. Um, so I think that's that's really what it was, just making adjustments. And there's a lot of people out there, a lot of, uh, I think we'd say skeptics is probably the right word, that say the quote-unquote halftime adjustments, or in this case, the quarter adjustments, maybe in between drives. When you guys meet, you know, around the bench, some teams now have like the tablet kind of deal where you're looking back through at some plays. A lot of people say that's just straight bullshit. I'm going to go ahead and use this box score in this game as a great example of uh, maybe proving them wrong. I think it's a conversation that's happened across all levels of college and professional football for a long time. But there are seriously some things that get talked about there that uh, could be some game-changing type of adjustments. So you guys now, though, you're 4-0 arguably the toughest next three weeks of the season compared to anyone in the country, but that comes with playing in the WIAC. You guys are uh, no stranger to that. How does it feel right now, though, to be in control of your destiny, so to speak, with having a quote-unquote perfect record? I can say that. You can't. Uh, moving forward and, uh, you know, having the ability to have the WIAC run through Platteville this year. Yeah, you know, it, it feels like it, it feels all right. Like, it feels like we're just doing business. <laughs> we're doing our jobs. You know, because that's like, nice we're not, you to say, but no, I, I, that's good. That's good of you to say, man. I like that. And and not not to not to understate the no, win that right. we yep. had against a really great team. Um, like you can't understate any conference wins for sure. Like we enjoy those moments, we celebrate those things. But when it's time to get back to business, we're back to business. And like I said, you can't get too far ahead of yourself. You can't get too far behind either. So, you know, our conference schedule is tough. Next three weeks, tough. 
but it's always going to be tough. And to get where we want to be, which is to win the national championship, that's going to be tough too. So oh, yeah. we are going to approach that the same way we approach any game, just business-like, get in there and get out with a win. Hey, you were saying all the right things, by the way. Um, I am absolutely giving you a hard time for it, but you are absolutely saying all the right things. That's that's exactly the mindset you have to have moving forward, right? And it's fun for yeah. uh, fun and easy, I should add, for someone on the outside like myself to speculate and talk about those things. You're saying all the right things, and, and you guys have the right mindset uh, in that locker room down there. Is this your, your sixth year in the program down at Platteville? Yes. That's awesome, dude, for someone to, to stick through. And, and now not only stick through the program, but now being a major contributor that you have these last couple of years is, is a pretty special deal. How have you grown as a player, I guess, and a man in your time down at Platteville? Oh, man, like it's it's really been a ride. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a journey. And um, I owe a lot of my growth to, you know, the coaches and the people around me. There's a ton of really great people here in Platteville, and it's really what makes it uh, an attractive place to, to play football at. Um, and I, I've made long strides in my, uh, game and off the field as a person throughout my time here. And again, it's really just like, it's about the people around me. Um, I've been put in the right situation and I've been so blessed to be put in this situation where I can grow and I can be placed in situations where I can go do what I'm best at on the field, especially. So um, it's been, it's been quite a ride. Like I said, I've learned a ton of things and um, I'm looking forward to keep it, keeping it going. hundred percent, man. And it's one thing to be in that spot where like you talk about, you have those opportunities and those people to help carry you along. It's another though, to take advantage of that, right? To take full advantage of that, which you seemingly have done um, from the outside looking in. So be sure to give yourself a lot of credit there when it comes to, to looking back on your, on your journey and being a pioneer. But uh, you and I both know that is not done just yet, brother. Good luck the rest of the way. Excited to continue covering you guys. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Sounds good. No problem, man. Have a good rest of your night. All right. Thanks. You too. See ya. A big thank you to Brant for joining the program tonight. We're going to switch over and talk all things D2 football, everything you need to know week five that went down. Let's start with our pick for the game of the week this week in D2 football, that being the Wasps from Emory and Henry taking down the Bears from Lenore Ryan. 31-20 is the final, but it was a lot more interesting than that. Emory and Henry goes on and scores 21 points in the fourth quarter to end up taking this one. Had an interception at the end to close it out and make things a little less interesting on the scoreboard. This game absolutely incredible very back and forth the first win over a ranked opponent in the wasps d2 era that itself is worthy of an applause shout out to these guys that is a massive massive win for this game down in the sac they outscored the bears 21-3 in the fourth quarter as i mentioned both teams generating multiple turnovers enh able to finish with points lenore was not this turnover late in the fourth quarter that would seal the deal icing on the cake for the wasps if you will and uh you look at this game i think something that jumps out too the time of possession very lopsided lenore ryan possessed the ball for 37 minutes and 10 seconds and lost that's crazy. Emory and Henry, 22-50, picking up the dub, even though they did not really have the ball inside of their possession for the majority of it. As far as in, uh, individual performances go, excuse me, Cole Lambert under center for Emory and Henry, maybe not his best day, 14 for 25, 149, two touchdowns, did have two interceptions on the day as well. The receiving core for Emory and Henry did step up. Cam Abshire, Jakari Mazel, and Cam Peoples, all with 50-plus yards, a couple touchdowns mixed in there as well, but defense Defensively, that's where the Wasps really had things going. Had three guys with 10 tackles apiece, four of them with TFLs, and then, of course, two guys with interceptions through the airs. Jacob Robinson ends up having a day for the Wasps. Had the interception, returned 25 yards, and then nine tackles on the day as well. So, certainly stepped up there. Seems like a very noteworthy win, something that can shake up the Southern Athletic Conference when it comes to that. Now, Let's move over to something a little bit different. How about a little bit of RMAC play? We're going to talk a lot about this game later with Jason Tommy, so I'll keep it semi-short and brief. The Mavs from Mesa. These teams have been playing. They played Colorado School of Mines. They went 14-13. to How about that mascot right there? That was badass. They went 14-13. to These teams have been playing since 1975. That is incredible. You saw a couple tackles right there. This defense was flying around the field on Saturday. It had been 1,078 days since an RMAC team had knocked off the Ore Diggers. That team back in 2021, well, it was the Mavericks from Colorado Mesa. They do it again. Take home the Nikos Cup. And uh, I will show you a couple pictures 
of this thing because it is pretty badass. And uh, admittedly, I could only really find photos that um, were held by the ore diggers because they have not, uh, Mesa has not had this trophy in a few years. This is at least a good look at the Nyko, Nyko's Cup, excuse me, and kind of what it entails. Nothing like crazy significant about the actual model of the trophy, but uh, still a pretty cool deal, a rivalry deal out there in Colorado and a big time moment for this Mesa program that is taking it home for the first time in what, three seasons now, correct? So a big time win for them. Like I said, we'll talk more about that with Jason Tommy later in the show. Now, let's keep things moving here. We've got uh, a late touchdown lifting the uh, Augie Vikings, excuse me, over the Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs. Big shout out to Dakota News Now for these highlights as we go through and talk about this game. Augustana taking on Minnesota Duluth. They end up winning this one 28-24. Great bounce back win for this Vikings team who were dropped from the top 25 last week. They lost a close game to Moorhead, who's been kind of up and down inside of the NSIC play this year. It was the third consecutive game with over 100 receiving yards for Augie's Jack Fisher. That seems like a uh, pretty important statistic and one that uh, we ought to keep track of. And you look at some of this tape as well. It's not like they uh, totally shut down this uh, Duluth offense. You see Wall Jasper here getting on the left side, built like an absolute tank, diving for the pylon. Kyle M1 Abrams, Wall Jasper. They maybe need to trademark that one from me. Uh, but this one, a lot of great performances offensively. Wall Jasper actually was pretty efficient through the air as well. Uh, but unfortunately for him, Augustana gets the job done and cleans things up defensively. Augie didn't run the ball particularly well in this one. But we talked about Jack Fisher with a breakout performance. Eight catches, 148, and a touchdown through the air. That certainly seems noteworthy. And then Augie on defense had four different guys with TFLs in the backfield. Uh, five different pass breakups in the day, which, you know, sometimes those are kind of finicky. So the fact that they're getting uh, mentioned in the box score means they are certainly Certainly legit. So, uh, big time win for Augie as the NSIC continues to cannibalize one another over there in the uh, Minnesota and other regions kind of going on over there. But, keep things moving forward here. How about the biggest matchup in the GLIAC, one of the best conferences in D2 football this week? Number two, Grand Valley State visiting Davenport, a closely unranked Davenport that was receiving a lot of votes prior to this week. We'll see if that changes because the Lakers take down the Panthers 27-7. to Here's some of the highlights from this one down in, I do believe, right in Grand Rapids where Davenport is located. The Lakers seemingly back to playing Grand Valley State football. This squad has looked incredibly competent the last two weeks. Talk about that big-time win over West Florida and now a win over a very potent Davenport squad. We had that game that played a little bit too close for comfort against that UWL team a few weeks back, a prominent D3 squad, but this time they took care of business. They led 24-7 to at half. Neither team scored in the second half. You see that man right there, Avery Moore, back to slinging it down the field. He had a couple of big-time receivers make plays for him over the course of this one. And, uh, you know, he spread the ball out. That Grand Valley offense spread the ball out incredibly well. Had two, four, six, eight, ten, maybe nine or ten different Lakers hauling in catches on the day. Eichelberger, as you see him right there, continues to be an absolute monster in the offensive backfield. He finishes this one for 13 carries, 104 yards, doesn't get into the end zone. But again, this Grand Valley offense is so multidimensional. Avery Moore slinging the ball all the way around. You had Kyle Knott, of course, doing his thing. Jordan Johnson, Kenneth Jones, Kenyon Owens. And then you go down the list, there's a lot of different people that got involved. And I think you look at this, Kellen Reed isn't even on that list. Kellen Reed's one of the better receivers for that Grand Valley State squad. He's not even on that list. So a lot of really good things. If you're a uh, Grand Valley State Lakers fan, they seem to be catching their stride at the right time, right when you get into conference play. And they did it against a really quality conference opponent in Davenport. So big time win for the Lakers. Ground and pound has certainly become the name of this Grand Valley State offense. Eating up clock, 51 carries as a team for GVSU combined, that feels pretty incredible. And that's something that's really tough to stop if you're Davenport or literally anyone lining up across from them. Grand Valley did have an interception in the end zone that stopped the Davenport drive early on. And uh, the GVSU defense allowed 89 yards total in the second half combined rushing and passing. Really tough to win against the Grand Valley State squad like that, them and Harding looking almost untouchable right now, but uh, that could be the best jinx or the worst jinx, depending on uh, what side 
of the ball you're rooting for. Let's move to a team that has been really exciting to watch, another team that has been doing a lot of the ground and pound, that being the Carson Newman Eagles. They play host to Barton, and Carson Newman in a pretty close matchup. They take down Barton 28-17. to They are in the top 25 poll. I believe they've actually gotten bumped up a few spots as of this week, but Carson Newman takes the win in this one. You see here, though, the start of the game, that's not Carson Newman scoring the ball. That's Barton taking back the opening kick for a score. You look at this game. Barton scored 17 points. The Carson Newman defense did not allow a touchdown. They scored 17, but the Carson Newman defense did not allow a touchdown. You see them get into the triple option here. How about a little trickery on the reverse? Coming up field, breaking that one off. They had a couple guys have really big days with this Carson Newman offense. But going back to this defense, did not allow a touchdown. The second touchdown was a scoop and score in the second quarter for Barton. So this defense was actually, I mean, incredibly lights out. The Eagles now 5-0, and 3-0 and in conference play down there in the South Atlantic Conference. The victory gave them their first 5-0 and start since 2007. And their first five-game winning streak since the 2019 season. It is the 13th 5-0 opening to a football campaign in Carson Newman history. And that might seem like not a crazy number. This is a storied program, folks. It's a program that's been around and had success. So for them to be up there with some of those teams is certainly very, very impressive. So going through, we'll continue to watch the tape on this one. But I wanted to highlight some of the individual performances here. And I would be remiss if I did not start with Jaden Sullins. 31 carries, 261 yards, and a touchdown for Jaden Sullins out of the backfield for Carson Newman. He was joined by the likes of Jeremiah Carroll, Don Bradley, Cam Ferguson, some of the uh, the usual weapons there for the Eagles. Zane Whitson at quarterback, 5 for 7, 59 yards there. But that's not what they have him back there to do. They have the big boys up front to move the pile, keep the drives going for this Carson Newman squad. Barton, on the other side of things, they actually had almost no success running the ball. Finished with 33 yards on the ground, only threw for 164. So really a, not a great day to be a Barton Bull dog offensively this is the second touchdown I was referring to the scoop and score a little bit of a strip sack potentially I guess that's how it would go down in the stat book on the quarterback that one returned for almost 90 yards that hurts but sign of a good team is able to bounce back and do that Carson Newman certainly answered the bell in that regard went into halftime up 21 17 this is a pretty close game Carson Newman gets the only score of the second half in front of it looks like 3,500 people down there at uh, Berktar Stadium. So, big time win for the Eagles. Don't be surprised if we continue to talk about them because they continue to play some damn good football down there. So, exciting win for them. Let's keep things moving. How about number nine, Slippery Rock, at number 21, IUP, in, I believe, what was the only top 25 ranked matchup in all of the country for this slate this week. Slippery Rock takes this one 33-32. Over the Crimson Hawks, a lot of great things coming out of this one. You look at offensively, kind of what was going on here. Karst Hunter, Braden Long, two names we've talked a lot about on this one. Braden Long, 22 for 31, 205, three touchdowns, did have an interception. Karst Hunter, pretty solid on his side as well. 15 for 29, 181, and three tuds through the air. The thing about Hunter, though. He ran for 113 yards and another touchdown with his feet. So accounted for four on the day and uh, just about 300 yards total. He was the entirety of this IUP offense. Just not enough to get it done for them when it was all said and done. Slippery Rock, kind of the difference here, had a little bit better of a rushing attack when it comes down to it. A lot less negative plays for the Rock in this one. You look at the time of possession, they had about five minutes better there. Both these teams' defense is stepping up big time on third down. They were a combined four of 20, both these teams, on third down throughout the entirety of this one. But the crazy part on the flip side of that is both these teams were a perfect four for four in the red zone. So two offenses that certainly know how to score, combined with two defenses that are great on critical key downs, this is the result you get. 33-32 uh, game where the Slippery Rock team right now, that is a very, very important win for this Slippery Rock football team. Look at some of their wins leading up to this point. That's their second game of PSAC play. They opened the, the year uh, with a really quality win over a New Haven squad, and now they're 5-0. and 2-0 and inside a PSAC play. Coming down the barrel, you got Gannon, California PA, Clarion, Seton Hill and Bloomsburg, no shot at any of those teams, right? 
There is not a team on that list I don't think Slippery Rock is going to take down and take down handedly. This Rock team right now looks really good, and if IUP was not going to stop them, I don't believe anyone in the PSAC on the schedule, anyone in the PSAC on the schedule will. Obviously, you've got Kutztown that's ranked up there in that kind of Power 10 ranking. There's a very good chance that PSAC championship game will feature the Bears and the Rock once again. But let's uh, talk a couple more stats about this one. Some last-minute heroics, though, to take things off for Slippery Rock. Right here, barely any time left in the fourth quarter. Braden Long lofts this one up to the back corner of the end zone. Mike Solomon, 12 seconds left. Slippery Rock. That would be the score that decided it. I certainly don't want to make it seem like it was a wire-to-wire -wire win for Slippery Rock. IUP had them on the ropes throughout the entirety of this game, but when it came down to it, the Rock makes some timely plays offensively to close this things out. The Hawks would bounce back. They had a 54-yard field goal attempt that was no good that, uh, you know, could have potentially made things interesting here and forced some extra football. More than 6,000 people in attendance for this one. That's a ridiculous number. I love that for D2 football. Slippery Rock, in their last 39 games against PSAC West schools, is 37-2. and two. I'm going to leave you with that as we talk about this one. So, big-time score for uh, Braden Long and company over there in Slippery Rock to get the job done against the Crimson Hawks. Let's keep things going. One of our last kind of highlighted games today, another big-time upset. This time, though, Sioux Falls taking down number seven, Minnesota State. This game was all over the place. I'm going to play kind of sparingly a couple of the touchdowns for the Cougars as I talk about this one. Here's one of them late in the third quarter. This game was 30-9 to in the third quarter. You're about to see the touchdown that, excuse me, would make it 30-9 to for this Sioux Falls team. How about the little dump off here over the middle and a scramble? for about 50 to 60 yards to the end zone. And, of course, Twitter's going to go ahead and black out on the video there. But that is a big-time score. Those uniforms are beautiful for the Sioux Falls squad. I, I dare say those are awesome. A statement win, though, for Coach Glow in year two at Sioux Falls. He was the former D.C. at Mankato, was there for seven years, had a lot of success with this Maverick squad, goes over to take the head job at Sioux Falls, an in-conference squad over there on the NSIC, and then this is what he does. He comes back, and he beats Mankato and he does it on their home field. So that was one of the big-time scores for this Sioux Fall squad. This uh, had a couple of other good plays right here for you as we move along. Here's another big-time touchdown. Oh, no. Excuse me, that was the same one. But um, going through and looking at this one, you know, there were some big-time plays in here for both these squads. You talk about some of the individual performances. Hayden Neckern has certainly come into his own for that Minnesota State squad. He's a quarterback that has gone from a quarterback that's not going to lose you a game to now a quarterback that is going to go out and win you games. And obviously, wasn't able to do it in this one, but that's not of any fault of his own. 26 of 41, 317, and three touchdowns. That's something. He also rushed for 16 yards. He has the ability to do stuff with his legs um, as far as getting out and making some plays outside of the tackle box, but didn't see a whole lot of that inside of this one. The rushing attack from Sioux Falls was certainly very solid. Camden Dean had a good day through the air. Four touchdowns, did have two turnovers. Receiving-wise, Gabe Hagen from uh, Minnesota State at eight catches, 125 and two touchdowns. How about Carter Slekius? Hopefully, it got that one correct. Seven catches, 147, and two touchdowns. Some great offensive performances from both of these squads. Kai West, defensive back from Minnesota State, coming up with that big-time interception. How about eight tackles and half a TFL on the day, too? He's someone that they really like over there in that defensive secondary for Mankato. But again, uh, the biggest storyline is Coach Glow. Year two at Sioux Falls, comes back, has a big statement win against this Mankato squad. That is uh, certainly noteworthy. But quick hitters here. Before we go over to D3 football, Clark Atlanta, their unbeaten season ends at the hands of FCS Savannah State, 35-28. They're taken down. They had some heroics last week against Bethune Cookman with that big-time field goal, but their unbeaten season comes to an end. Still a lot going on for that squad. But don't look now. West Virginia State, 4-1, and 3-0 and in MEC play after a 45-34 win, excuse me, over Fairmont State on Saturday. West Virginia State. I was not familiar with your game. That is a big time win. You guys are 3-0 and in conference play. Not a team we talked about enough. Certainly might have to more going down, moving forward with the show here. Outscored Fairmont 35-3 to in the fourth quarter. At this rate now for this 
West Virginia State team, their game versus Charleston November 16th could be for the MEC title. So keep an eye on that. Johnson C. Smith, they keep things going versus Virginia State. They win 21-17. A statement win for that Golden Bulls squad. How about UND outlasting William Jewell in overtime 23-20 for what, all things considered, will probably be the GLVC title. That game is probably going to be the one that determines it. Winona takes out Moorhead 33-6. to They limit the dynamic passing attack over there for the Dragons. They uh, force two interceptions through the air from off the arm of Jack Strand. Another NSIC, two more of them matchups. Concordia St. Paul beats you, Mary, in double overtime 19-13. to And Northern State with the upset of Bemidji State 14-13. to NSIC right now is cannibalism across the board. I'm here for it. A lot of great football being played over there. Finally, Fort Hayes State, they knock off number 12, UCM, 21-7. to The second time the Mules have been knocked off by unranked foes this year. And that's no fluke. Fort Hayes State, Central Oklahoma, these are not just your run-of-the-mill unranked games. These are teams that are incredibly competent in a really good conference down there in the NYAA. So that's all we've got for D2 this week. Let's move over and uh, get to another guest conversation as well as the D3 football conversation with Jimmy Martin. Also joining the show tonight, defensive back for the Mavs over at Colorado Mesa. Proud new owner of some new hardware, that being the Nikos Cup, Jason Tommy. What's going on, dude? Nothing much, nothing much. I was excited to be here. Dude, I'm excited to have you here. You guys probably a little bit more excited to add something to that hardware case over there at Mesa. How's it feel to have uh, some quote-unquote new hardware, or is it more of uh, bringing it back to where it's supposed to be originally? Bringing it back where it's supposed to be. It's been a few years. No one's really beat mines in a couple of years, so it's pretty exciting to do it for a rivalry game and bring it back where it belongs. A few years is definitely a way of saying it. It was the last time they were beating the RMAC play, man. 2021, you guys, Mesa, the ones to knock them off. But between that time, over a 1,000 calendar days before something like this feat was pulled off, which makes it just all the more impressive. You guys, though, you look solid. And defensively, that effort was a big part of it. You haul in a big interception yourself in the second quarter, which seems like a really, really tough feat against this mind squad. That defense steps up plenty more. It feels like you guys... Obviously not able to get on the board offensively in the first half. Talk about the defensive effort early on and keeping the guys into it and engaged in a rivalry matchup that you mentioned before. We just trusted our conditioning through uh, fall camp, and we knew we'd been through the ringer through that. So I knew uh, as as uh, the defense just stayed in it that we were going to grind them down offensively, and it showed towards the end of the game as uh, we were able to grind it out, put string some possessions together, and – we were able to just keep getting them the ball, keep keeping everything in front. So it, it was an awesome fourth quarter, though. Dude, I, that's saying it incredibly lightly. You guys go on and score uh, multiple times in that fourth and, and literally get just enough to go ahead and put you ahead of that mind squad. Um, one of those being, do you have a blocked PAT as well? Uh, they missed it. They, uh, hit it the, the miss. they hit the post. I got you. I got you. So, like... Those kind of plays that, that come through and, and end up being big determining factors uh, in these kind of games. But this Mines team, let's talk about the other side of the ball before we go back talking about the Mavs, right? They've been putting up numbers, uh, but not maybe the ones we're used to seeing the last couple of years with the guy like Matoka under center, the Harlan Hill winner. Those are uh, some stats that probably are not going to be touched for, for quite some time. Now, that's not to understate the talent they have offensively right now. Foster under center is no joke. But people don't realize the major weapons that are around him, right? McLeod, Shield, those guys on the outside are kind of just the tipping point. Uh, I guess the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of this mine's offense. You go back in the backfield, Landon Walker, the O-line, that is no joke. What was it like game planning for all of those guys? It's not like you can key in on one or the other because obviously the other ones will make you hurt. What was it like game planning for that full eleven? We knew uh, we just had to put together a complete game defensively. We have arguably, in my mind, the best secondary in the country with that. And we know we can compete with anybody. Hell and yeah. our front seven played out of their mind. They played a great game, really stuffed the run, forced them to pass. And when they passed, we made plays on the ball. And uh, we were able to just keep everything in front, limit the big plays. And, I mean, Mines, they have uh, a lot of great guys over there. So, it was a lot of fun being able to compete against some of the best players in the country that have been doing it for multiple years now. So it was a it was a great, great game for us, and it was a lot of fun. Now, as someone who geographically is just very far away from this whole uh, ordeal up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, is this a rivalry where it's one of those bitter deals, or is there a lot of respect shown on the field during the game? How What is that kind of environment like for both these sides? 
I think there's a lot of respect. Uh, mine's obviously has built a, a great program. And yeah. the narrative around us is that we're a young team. And that's been the narrative since Coach K has uh, gotten the Mesa job. But um, we're ready to win now. And so I am I think they had uh, a lot of respect for us as well because we showed them that we could compete with them. Um, and, uh, like, obviously they're a great program. So it was a, it was yep. a great win for us. Hundred percent. If they didn't have respect before, guess what, dude? They do now. They have to. You didn't really give them a choice. So uh, that's usually the best way of going about it. They do say respect is earned. I would say uh, you guys certainly did that on Saturday. And you talk about that front seven, right? And the performance that they put together. I think a lot of times we hear about how maybe that defensive secondary can help benefit that front seven. You talk about things like a coverage sack is kind of a term that is thrown around a lot by different play-by-play and color guys across the country. Talk about what a disruptive front seven can do for your defensive secondary and how that really complements what you guys have going on in that defensive backfield. I think it goes hand in hand. They they make life easy for us. We make life easy for them. And it was a combination of both them getting pressure, bailing us out a few times, and us getting coverage sacks, bailing them out a few times. So I think it was a, overall just playing great team defense was our focus, and we were able to do that against one of the best teams in the country. I would certainly tend to agree there, my friend. And uh, talking about Coach K a little bit, he spoke about how this team was due for what he called the, quote, program defining win right he had mentioned that phrase a couple times uh you know during this week what does that kind of phrase mean to you and this Mav squad well there's a lot of opportunities playing in the RMAG we play a lot of great teams but every week we know uh no one's gonna just give it to us so uh we had to go out there and take it um which we did and hopefully this uh turns the tides for uh Colorado Mesa we're able to keep this momentum rolling for the rest of the season Absolutely. I think it's a good way of looking at it. And um, it's not like, and you and I both know, and then Coach K, obviously, you don't win one game and all of a sudden your program is boom to the top levels of, uh, you know, D2 national scene. But now this feels like a program defining win could be something where now you guys have this extra level of confidence. And now you're maybe clicking on the defensive side in ways that maybe haven't happened before. Where have you seen those kind of biggest improvements you've made as a team? Because you guys obviously haven't been perfect this year. I have a couple of blemishes on the record. But this is certainly a team that we've seen make great strides, both offensively and defensively. Where have you seen some of those big-time improvements in your eyes? Well, I think the whole team has just improved drastically from uh, the beginning of the season. Um, we weren't playing as loose the first couple of weeks, and I think that really changed the past few weeks. Uh, the whole defense has been playing loose. The offense is starting to open it up. Um and the combination of those two things have led to two great wins in a row. So I'm hoping that we can keep that rolling into the rest of the season and keep stringing some wins together. Playing loose is important, and you kind of touch on that. Getting somebody to play loose, not so simple, right? Especially when uh, maybe you have – some younger guys on a squad that are trying to put together some schemes or trying to know their assignments on different kind of uh, setups or plays. How do you get – at least defensively, because you can speak on that. How do you get those guys to play loose? Is that a lot of assignment-based pieces and them knowing exactly how they fit into a system? Is that a confidence thing, a combination of both, or something else entirely? I think it's a combination of both. Um, it's a big confidence thing with a lot of younger guys who don't have as much experience. Um, I was a younger guy last year, and I had some uh, great leaders that helped me um, when I was in the game. So I think uh, as long as there's a uh, over communication on the field mm -hmm. um, everyone's going to be able to do their job do it well and do it to the best of their ability uh fast uh, in particular and i think uh communication is like the main the main reason for that Got to have a field general out there on the uh, defensive side of the ball as well. We talk about the uh, helmet comms coming to the D1 level. Can't wait till we get a mic up in your uh, next to your nugget out there on the defensive side, huh? Yep, yep, i can't wait for that. <laughs> Having a headset on at some point for college football games at any level, there is so much shit being said on those headsets. I can only imagine just the process of getting that to a working stage at these levels of football uh, when they continually ask more and more of these of these programs now with instant replay and the tablets on the sidelines and other things you have going on. It'll be an interesting day when that does come here, but let's talk about the days right now. Defensively, seven interceptions through five games for you guys. Obviously a big force fumble this past weekend. How are you able to generate those kind of takeaways? I mean, Coach K and Coach Matthews, our DC, 
we always emphasize that the ball is the issue. So if we can get the ball, take it, no matter how many yards the offense gets, if we take the ball away, they're not going to be able to score and we put it in the hands of our offense, good things will happen. So we're always focused on the ball. That's that's the main reason we're playing defense. We're go, we're trying to get that ball. So Hell yeah. The ball is the issue. That's the first time I heard it like that. Obviously, you, the ball is the program is one that gets thrown around you know, every once in a while. And people have different ways of kind of, you know, kind of – hyping up that turnover battle and that margin, but uh, the ball is the issue. I like that a lot, dude. But, Jason, that's all I've got for you, my man. Best of luck this weekend, Adam State, and onwards, brother. I'm going to be excited to continue following you guys along the way, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good night. All right, let's talk some D3 football. And when it comes to D3 football, I think the last couple of weeks, and I think most weeks of the season, start and end in the WIAC, my friend. You know it uh, better than most, Jimmy. We're going to get going here with uh, our selection for the game of the week. Number 20, UW-Platteville. They go into number 5, UW-Lacrosse. Take the win over the Eagles in overtime on a ridiculous play that we talked about uh, with Brant. But 30-27, to 27, dude, talk to me about this one. Well, uh, first of all, there were 4,600 people at this ball game. Yeah. I want that to be addressed. Like, always a great environment at uh, Roger Herring Stadium for lacrosse, but they got sent home unhappy in this one. Uh, shocking loss for lacrosse. Uh, uh, they were probably picked to win the WIAC this year, and now obviously Plyville comes in there with a stellar performance. I mean, offensively, defensively, everything you want to name it. Like they played an unbelievable ball game coming out in overtime with the double pass to win it in overtime. Like, oh man, like that's there's no better way to win a game on a trick play. Like, that's that's unbelievable. Like the, that's probably one of the biggest. One of the biggest wins in program history. I mean, I'd have to go yeah. back and look historically, but like on the road at lacrosse, like they're eight and a half point underdogs too, by the way, on the Hanson ratings too. So that's yep. a huge win. Huge win. Which I actually thought would have probably been more like going on the road with uh, a Platteville defense that we know has shown up and traveled incredibly well, but uh, an offense, not to say that we didn't expect a lot from, but we just, we didn't maybe know exactly what we'd get in this kind of top ranked matchup. The defense started things off incredibly hot. You talk about seeing some stops here in the first quarter, both teams combined for like 60 yards of total offense. It was not a great offensive start, largely in part to turnovers like this, a fumble that ends up giving UWL uh, some really great field position in the first quarter. But, uh, and then, the, the first half man the cross leads seven to three this ball game was nothing ridiculous and there's an interception in the end zone and you had turnovers back and forth in the first half and I think both these teams settled down and uh you know Wisconsin Platteville I think was just one of the teams that they were the last one standing and got the last punch in it was just a matter of who would have the ball last yeah we yeah we saw that in this one who gets the ball last kind of a game you know we see a lot of those in the Y, especially with lacrosse that dynamic offense uh, and I, you know, coming t- touching on Platteville though, Michael Priami, 358 yards and three touchdowns against, yep. you know, a uh, pretty strong uh, defensive backfield for Lacrosse. And then, you know, as, uh, Lacrosse also, you know, two splitting two quarterbacks. Saw that in that one. Uh, yep. Awesome. Yeah. Weird. Man, man, oh man, that's interesting. But uh. And they've done quite a bit of that. It's not the first time that they've done kind of uh, that two-quarterback type system. I think we've actually come to kind of expect that out of them at this point. Even when you go back and you have a guy like Kaiser Helzerbrand running things there uh, a year ago, and there were still times that he came out of the game because you have a guy that uh, bears a lot of the blows on those on those running plays. So to bring in uh, some help from him, whether it's just passing the ball or just take a couple plays off, sometimes those guys need that rest. So I think we've kind of come to expect that from this UWL offense. And there's some really good teams in the D2 level you look at Grand Valley's done a little bit Ferris State does it a lot especially when Carson Golker is healthy in kind of the Midwest area that run a similar style when it comes to a two quarterback system the old adage of if you have two quarterbacks you have none maybe not so much the case in today's college football world but uh if your team's good enough I suppose you can make just about anything work oh absolutely 100 percent. in terms of like you got a good enough team it's not really Obviously, it matters who's playing quarterback, but you have you have a really good defense. You have a really good old line. Like you're gonna have a good chance. You know, yeah, it's a team game. Team game. 
Yep, and an unappreciated part of this, too, you see a couple of the plays he makes here. Gabe Lynch out of the backfield for this eagle attack, and we saw him playing in person a year ago, and this guy is dynamic out of the backfield. He's good, obviously, between the tackles, powerful and physical enough. He's not exactly a bruiser type of running back, but powerful and physical enough to break some tackles inside the box. He had 24 carries for 120 yards, two touchdowns on the day, but also elusive enough, once again, to get out in space. We saw a little bit earlier, you pitch him a little screen, pass he puts a man on the ground makes another one fall to the ground and he's got a good combination and a good skill set for that offensive backfield for lacrosse that I don't think maybe is complimented uh, quite enough so uh, big time plays for him in this one I think certainly was highlighted and then you talk about Brant dude seven catches 189 two touchdowns have a fucking day yeah and obviously the toss too I mean just pop it off with that man holy cow yeah that is awesome. And again, Jack Studer, still not a bad day. Four catches, 74 yards. But for him, we've come to expect a lot more from him offensively, haven't we? Yeah, but, you know, I mean, sometimes you get greedy. You know, you can't always expect a guy to score every single week, you know. So, you know, you got to have other guys contribute at times. And, uh, you know, as good as he is, you know, if you you have a high, high safety on the whole game, you know, I mean, it's going to be tough. You have two guys on him. So, yeah, especially when you talk about uh, trying to take some of those shots down the field, depending on uh, what that defensive secondary looks like uh, and what kind of looks Platteville were giving them. And, and again, I think it's underappreciated, too. These are two teams that are incredibly familiar with each other, that see each other year in and year out. This is not the first time this Platteville team has had to uh, get up and get ready for this lacrosse offense, or even Jack Studer, for that matter, right? They're familiar with playing these guys. But we'll move over to a game that had quite a bit more people in attendance, Jimmy, by quite a bit more. I mean, 21,000 uh, plus down in yeah, Perkins uh, for this Whitewater Oshkosh game that breaks a D3 on campus record for say, most people not- in attendance. Insane. Whitewater ends up pulling this one out. 21 14. The Warhawks take the victory, my friend. Yeah, I know. I was just about to say, you know, 21,000 people for a Division three game. I is, can't even wrap my head around that. It's a dream for us come true, Kobe. You know, the, the Division One rejects get 21,000 people. So, and by the way, Division One rejects isn't just us. It's all it's the whole non-Division One community. I want that to be said as well. Uh, we're all Division One rejects together, I believe. So, um, you know, kind oh, of I hear you. To- yeah, and it's not something yeah. like we're not trying yeah. to like put that name onto people, right? It came exactly. from like no. you know what I mean. Yeah. You, you kind of interpret it as you may, but. You talk about T1 Rejects, man. That's a lot of people showing up for small school football. I absolutely love it. That place and atmosphere had to have been electric. And you you know, it's crazy too. All those people there and a great UW-Whitewater team that we've talked about. They didn't start off incredibly hot, Jim. This Oshkosh team drives right down the field and scores in the first quarter. Had some really good things going for them. It wasn't like UWW had this thing rolling from the jump. And they had a lot of great offensive plays, don't get me wrong. But uh, this Oshkosh, Oshkosh squad, excuse me, showed up and kind of punched them in the mouth. They lead 7 nothing after the first quarter. But a sign of a really good team, dude, is Whitewater to bounce back, score twice in the second, and actually go into halftime leading by a score. Yeah, man. Uh, I uh, there's one there's one play in particular from that game I saw. There's a clip. It was Oshkosh was driving, and uh, there's this huge like uh, this guy broke a few tackles. This guy, the Oshkosh tight end, broke a few tackles, and I think it was a safety or someone just flew out of nowhere and just popped him, and the ball flew on. Uh, Whitewater recovered the ball, and Oshkosh was driving too, and that kid made a heck of a play too before he fumbled as well. I want to mention that, but uh, you know, a, a few a few huge plays in that game. Uh, you know, and obviously that was one I wanted to mention. So, yep, there's the first touchdown for Whitewater. That's Drake Martin plunging that one into the end zone there for the Warhawks. They'd even things up into the second quarter. Got things going even more. Oshkosh did not go down quietly, though. Still making big-time plays offensively. But um, Oshkosh wouldn't score again until the fourth quarter. And, and that's where Whitewater kind of pulled this one away. When you look at kind of some of the breakdown here, the attack for Oshkosh, if you've if you noticed here, if you're watching on YouTube, was all through the air. They had almost no rushing attack, nine yards total on the ground when it came to this Titan attack. And it's not something that maybe should be incredibly surprising. It's just kind of the team that we've come to see from this Titan squad. They haven't been a ground-focused team, but nine yards. That's like to the extreme of like a Minnesota Moorhead at the D2 level of a team that literally just does not run the football 
That is a big-time play down the sideline for Whitewater. They made a couple of those. Uh, through the air, Oshkosh did substantially better, but at the end of the day, just wasn't enough to overcome this Whitewater squad. An interception and a lot of a difference in time of possession. I think that was a big piece, too. 37 minutes to 23. That's what you can afford when you run the Brock efficiently, and uh, Whitewater certainly did that. So... Other than that, four sacks for Whitewater, too. That's something that certainly comes into play here. But, uh, you know, this Whitewater team, I think, was on fraud watch after the UMHB snafu is a nice way of saying it. Three interceptions is returned for touchdowns in the first three drives. I think it's safe to say they're still a very competent football team. Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, we're going to find out firsthand here coming up this week, so. Yep, there you go. I was going to say that should be coming down, uh, coming right down the pipeline. So uh, that one not in Perkins Stadium, though, correct? Nope, right here. So that's uh, that's about twenty one thousand reasons that uh, is probably a good thing because that is uh, that'd be a wild place to go out uh, and, and compete in. But let's move over to uh, another top twenty five matchup, which we had a lot of this week. We were spoiled. We were spoiled on the D three slate, man. Jinx, you owe me a soda. And uh, let's go over and talk about Harden Simmons, number seven, taking on number 12, Endicott. And uh, also a big shout out to the D3 zone once again for cutting up these highlights for us so we can play them and talk about these games on the show. Really do appreciate you for doing that. But let's shout talk out. about the Cowboys. And, and this Cowboys team is one that is finally getting some of the national recognition that uh, I think they deserve. And you know, going by the AFCA polls, it's number nine, Endicott, and number eight, Harden Simmons. So this really is a top 10 match up uh, in some ways. And this Harden Simmons, this Cowboy offense has been playing at an incredible clip. You beat UMHB last year for the first time in who knows how long. And now it feels like they've taken the driver's seat of the ASC. We're going to find out next week, of course, when these two teams face off. But let's talk about this game with the Seagulls, man. What'd you see? Yeah, Harden Simmons, uh, they had 35 minute time of possession and 200 yards on the ground. Uh, I think that was the key in this one. Noah Garcia had himself a day, 126 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown. Uh, Kyle Brown was also super efficient through the air, completing uh, 229 yards at a seven, sorry, 78% clip uh, completion percentage. So, oh, my light went off there, but uh, but uh, he had himself back. <laughs> That's a heck of a game. See, the computer is not just for my notes. It's also for, like, the lighting for the camera, too. <laughs> it really is. Truthfully, it is. It is. Comp a complex setup over there uh, we've got. But, no, I, th I think you're right. I think that was a, a big piece of it. Noah Garcia kind of being one of the workhorses in this Harden-Simmons offense. You see him here driving down, and it is just run after run after run after run. Try here on the quarterback keeper to get things going across the goal line. Harden-Simmons would have some success early. They scored in the first quarter, went into halftime, tied up at 14 with Endicott, and then just had a little bit of a better second half, to be uh, completely honest. That's the easiest way of looking at it. This is a one score game that certainly could have gone either way they did better on the ground um, didn't maybe average as much per carry but had a lot more success there uh, the punting game was definitely one that actually was pretty impressive for this Endicott squad but otherwise you talked about the time of possession 9 of 15 on third down for this Harden Simmons squad 3 of 4 in the red zone some other big time uh, plays kind of throughout had a big time two point conversion at one point as well so just timely plays on both sides of the ball for this Harden Simmons team but like I said, dude, UMHB coming up this weekend. Yep, big one, big one, big one. You would imagine with only, what, four teams in that conference right now? Is that what it is? Yeah, I, that four? I think it's that, four, dude. That's weird. I'm pretty sure. Hold on, we're going we're gonna to look. Because, like, I mean, out. with conference realignments in Division One, I, I wouldn't be surprised. American they, Southwest Conference right now, my friend. You have Harden-Simmons, Mary Harden-Baylor, Howard Payne and East Texas Baptist. Wow. That's I, it. I feel foolish for not knowing that, but that's a tiny conference. Yeah. And they, <laughs> they've lost pieces. I think that's that's worth noting. Yeah. It hasn't always been that way, but right now it is four. And two of them happen to be pretty solid nationally ranked yeah. football teams, which is a pretty good percentage. 50% of your conference is nationally ranked. But, uh, yeah, four teams in a conference, is, it, their schedule, they're playing almost everyone twice throughout their entire season. Yeah, that's uh, a tough draw for those other teams, man. That's brutal. Yeah. It's pretty bad. But, brutal. Uh, 
and nonetheless, big time win for the Cowboys. We'll see what they do uh, this coming weekend against Mary Harden Baylor. Let's move forward. A lot more of a one sided game. Man, these games, dude, these games with North Central playing these quote unquote top 25 opponents. Why does it never feel like they're playing a top 25 dude. opponent? North Central, number one, goes down to number 23, Wheaton. They win for the Bell uh, Trophy 15 5 to 27. In what was really even a more dominant performance than that, Luke Landon puts on another clinic. Talk to me about this one, dude. I mean, North Central ran for 298 yards and seven rushing yards. <laughs> like, what is that, man? Like, that's dominance. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, we even put up 27. You know, I mean, they're gonna they scored some points, but like, man, oh man, I was. I just, I'm so, I'm just sick of talking about North Central, dude. All they do, they win. They just blow teams out, and, like, I'm just, like, that's all I talk about all week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're just so good. Like, I mean, I say that in the most, like, respectful way, too. I mean, I just, yes. like, it's the same thing. Like, there's never anything new with them. It's just, like, uh Like, I want to see someone, like, <laughs> like I want to see someone, like, challenge them in the regular season. You know, because obviously Corlin took them down last year. But, uh, man, oh, man. I mean, and then lacrosse played them really tough in that playoff game, too, like, there's yep. definitely teams that can take down North Central. It's just it's not a matter of that. It's just like they're coming. Yeah, you look last year, that lacrosse game was incredible. Yeah. You talk about yeah. the finish against Wartburg and that semifinal. That was an awesome matchup. And then obviously the national championship game with Cortland. There were some great games mixed in there. We saw Luke Lanin run in his first touchdown of the day on a 35-yarder. He had a 53-yarder in the second quarter as well, and then a 15-yarder in the third. This dude was doing it all with both his legs and his arm. How about a touchdown pass right there for the second score of the day that one to Joe Sacco he has been a constant weapon in that offensive backfield for North Central and as long as these guys are here man there's no way teams right now especially the CCIW are slowing down this offensive attack the way they're able to operate so efficiently and the offensive line unit that you talked about with that, those rushing stats they're not getting enough credit Luke Lane obviously does some freaky things on a football field that offensive line is a very big part of that they got up 21-7 at one point it was 41 to 14 and really 48 to 14 even before things started to kind of look a little bit better on the scoreboard, but this game, the score isn't even as as dominant of a showing as what it really was. I think. Yeah, I saw. I got Rod, our friend of the show, on uh, on Instagram, like his story, and he said he just picked a, took a picture of the scoreboard on Saturday. I'm like, damn, yeah. dude, like they're doing it again. I like think he said like little brother or something, or like bring that bell back. I don't oh, know. Oh boy, so, not a direct quote. I just it was something along those lines. I thought it was funny. Yeah, like, I think shut, it was just out. bring the bell back. Yeah, yeah. not to start any. Yeah. Not to start yeah. anything there, but... Oh, yeah, it was just something along, like, some teasing lines. Like, oh, yeah, to- which he's gone now. He's graduated and moved on, so he's certainly in a much better position to say those kind of things, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, absolutely. But, yeah, but now this is a game, too, uh, sharing some discourse on Twitter, where this was four, the, the, four of the last five games played, and this is that big-time run from Luke Lane, and how about this guy? He's got speed. He's got burners out there, which I don't know why he just... He just turns them on when he wants to, and he did it right there. But this is four out of the last five now for this big-time rivalry game, the CCIW, that have actually been played at Wheaton. There's a lot of discourse there of how that has been able to transpire, especially when these two schools, I believe, are under 10 miles from each other. Yeah, not far. Not far away. So the fact that four of the last five have been played on the Thunder's home field is kind of ridiculous and certainly something that will hopefully change. North Central, the Cardinals, will host the game in 2025 that has been released, but 2026 and onward is still TBD. So that's something that feels like they should not be able to get away with, but nonetheless, North Central maybe took that personally and just stacked the chips even higher, which as a number one seed is crazy, but that's just how they operate over there. I don't think it matters where they play. It's 10 miles away. Like North Central's fans can just drive 15 minutes. Like True. But very true, very true. But yeah, like you said, North Central continuing to be dominant, and I think people get on us like whether it's the North Centrals of the world, the Hardings, or those kind of teams that are week in week out just blowing out these squads, and it's like, what the hell do you want us to say? They're very good at football, yeah, incredibly good, and we're gonna talk about them when they come and play meaningful games. Like this is a meaningful game still, even though it was a blowout. But until then, there's other football to talk about, right? Like, yeah, I don't even know if we should cover them until like they are in the playoffs. So you just like, I don't even care. Like, I'm with you. Uh, some other storylines to close things up in D3 this week. Rochester University remains unbeaten with a 14 to seven win over RPI. It's the they're five and zero for the first time since 1992. Jimmy, that's a big win. I mean, there's that been is. a lot of like uh, curse 
or uh, streak breaking wins over the last few weeks. Uh, there I have. Love, you know, it's just it, it, there's just there's something in the air. You know, <laughs> maybe in the Upper Peninsula there could be another uh, streak breaking game. We'll see. I mean, it, there's been a lot of them this year. Jimmy, there's been so Jimmy, many. There's Jimmy, been so many. Jimmy. There's been so many. Jimmy. What? I love the cats. I love the cats. I'm repping oh. them tonight. The cats are at Grand Valley this week. 7 p.m. kick homecoming. College football, man. Any given Saturday. <laughs> Any given Saturday, man. I got the Except UP for this up. Saturday. Upper Peninsula. Look. I'm still bro. I'm repping the cats, too. It's the UP hat. Ah. <sighs> Not to steal the spotlight from this uh, University of Rochester squad. They opened up the year at uh, Olivet, which actually I think was a pretty big statement win for them uh, against, I believe it's the Comets there, 28-21 MIAA foe. They go on to have some convincing wins over Alfred State, Salve Regina, University of New England, and now RPI in their first game of Liberty League play. And this RPI team's kind of been down and out. Still a very competent football team, I think is is very much worth noting. 14-7 to win for them now. They're 5-0, some convincing wins. You're in the Liberty League play now. You're potentially your biggest test yet at Butterfield Stadium this coming weekend, Jimmy, against Ithaca College. So That'll be a big one. Be a big see one how that goes. Him. Still have some squads, Buffalo State, Union College, Hobart, that we'll talk about in just a second. Like There's some games coming down the line, but let's stick right in the Liberty League. Hobart, they take down Ithaca this past week, 16-7. to Defense steps up, holds the Bombers to uh, very little offensive production while well, they didn't take too much on their own end Hobart only actually had one touchdown on the day three field goals gets them to their final score of 16 and uh I think it's kind of crazy too you look at the breakdown of this one Hobart had 250 yards of total offense they only had nine first downs and they end up winning the football game <laughs> that's wild yeah that is not a lot of first down. that's not a lot of first down. yeah and so uh, a lot of that I think it's just field position, getting the ball in the right spot, finishing with field goals. They were not really able to finish uh, inside of the red zone, but uh, you look at it for Ithaca, interceptions for both Matthew Parker and Colin Schoen, the two interceptions there. So those are kind of the two field position type deals where they get the ball in good territory and are able to finish with field goals. But for Ithaca, Jalen Leonard Osborne, 25 carries, 144 yards on the ground. That's pretty big time. EJ Taylor on the other side, 99 yards and a touchdown for Hobart who, again, they didn't really do anything through the air, uh, which is crazy because they had 117 yards of total passing, Jimmy, and Ahmad Crowell um, uh, accounted for 91 of those yards on three catches. Wow. Jeez. That's awesome. Uh, that is that is really awesome. A couple standouts defensively, though, for Hobart. Anthony Romano, 16 tackles, and then uh, Diamond Bliss with 14 Romano also had an interception. That was one of the better stat lines in D3 football Dang. this past yeah. week. It's a hell of a game. Yeah, so big-time win for Hobart. How about some MIAA action to close things off? Albion, they beat Adrian 38-27 in that MIAA matchup, and Hope absolutely thumped Trine. Looks like they might run the table for that conference championship this year. Yeah, that's how it's looking. That's how it's looking. Yeah, after that win over Alma and – you kind of assumed maybe trying Albion, Adrian, one of those squads might be one of the last pieces to kind of go over it. If the way they looked against trying, I don't think there's either way one of those A schools even goes the distance with hope this year. Any given Saturday. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, Jim. But I'm excited to, to keep breaking it down, brother. Appreciate you uh, spending some time with me tonight, my man. As always, man. I always appreciate it. Yes, sir. Sounds good, dude. I'll see you. All right, take care. All right, we had some big-time upsets on the NAIA side of things this past weekend. Back in the saddle, Matt Schlorzler, what's going on, man? Not much, man. Just uh, hanging out and uh, having a good time, watching some NAIA football this weekend. And it was interesting, Kobe, because I really like to intermix my, you know, non-D1 football with some D1 football. That's how I watch. That's how I get the most out of my experience, okay? And there was a game on this weekend, if you recall, Alabama versus Vanderbilt. I do happen to recall, yes. Yep. I I think (laughs) a lot of us know what happened in this game where Alabama lost as the number one team in the country to Vanderbilt. And while it's not the number one team in the country, the number two team in the country getting upset at home is pretty up there 
Northwestern loses their first conference game in a really long time, especially to no one besides morning side. Like it's been a yes. really long time. Um, are beat by Concordia of Nebraska 29 to 17 in a shocker. Um, and I bring that up because obviously same breadth as the Alabama game, right? Uh, just an absolute stunner. Nobody was expecting this Concordia made it work with fantastic defense. And it's important to note that they did get five takeaways on the day. Uh, Northwestern's quarterbacks would throw four interceptions combined and have one fumble. That's not a recipe for success when Concordia is not turning the ball over. They're not a team that turns the ball over. They run the ball. They're consistent. They, they chip away at you on offense and their defense just swarms and they get to the ball. They're very well coached. And they just got Northwestern. Northwestern could get nothing going on offense. It ultimately nipped them in the butt. And Concordia was just able to use the turnovers to their advantage. They capitalized and scored 19 points off of turnovers. That was that was most of their points. So um, huge win for Concordia. They're always kind of in that tier below Dort, Morningside, Northwestern every year in the GPAC. Uh, but this is definitely something where they'll probably – they are getting votes this week in the poll um, yep. on every poll that I've seen. And they're they're building something pretty pretty sick down there in Concordia. So, Yeah, man. You look at those interceptions. The fact you have interceptions is obviously crucial. But you look at where they're happening. And the first one, uh, they're driving down in the red zone. And that drive is ultimately stopped, that Northwestern drive. The next one, Northwestern is on their own, like, 10-yard line. And they cough up the ball to the defense. And then you have a couple more even now as you, you roll back on the film that are happening around midfield that, like you said, it's one thing to also get the takeaways. It's another to go down and turn them into points. And that seems like uh, it's what Concordia was able to do really well in this one. And, and kind of like you said, you alluded to it, that's, that's really hard to come back from uh, from some struggles like that. And and that's almost what you need is some ridiculous stat like that to give Concordia an edge in a game like this, not to get, you know put down that team. But there's not a whole lot of other ways in which I think this result, uh, we kind of get this outcome from a Concordia team that, yes, I'm sure is much improved, but I don't think – you would say something as drastic as they're on the same level as a Northwestern squad day in and day out, week in and week out. But that's where football is a, is a very interesting game. It doesn't matter. All those things don't matter. It's whoever shows up on Saturday. And uh, when you have four takeaways through the air, another one on the ground, that's success. Yeah. This Northwestern team is clearly struggling without Jalen Gramstad and they've won all their other games up to this point, but it is, it is really tough to get things going when you've got to switch between quarterbacks, uh, Colby Duncan and Hay- uh, Hayden Gruce, excuse me. They each go for like 120 and 80 yards apiece, only one one touchdown between them and four interceptions. That just can't happen. And that's not something Northwestern is used to happening. Like it, nobody's used to that happening to them, themselves especially. Um and Jalen Graham said, obviously very happy. He had an opportunity to go play at Nebraska, the team you rooted for growing up. That's awesome. But man, there it, it feels like there's a big Jalen Gramstad sized hole in this offense right now. That's a very good way um, of saying that. And and you see the tape and you see some obviously some short yardage type situations where Concordia is able to convert. And you shared with me maybe a fascinating way in which they were able to make that happen. At that being nine offensive linemen on the field at one point, and you look at these pictures, dude. Oh my goodness, that is FU football. That is Absolutely. incredible. Um, and again, this is not something they're running, you know, this is no four-minute drill on the 50-yard line. This is a goal line package that they obviously have put together. But you see 58 and 60 looks like the numbers here are almost in that, uh, you know, two yards behind the line of scrimmage type deal. And this is just a formidable, intimidating formation. Uh, if I've ever seen one, dude, that is an awesome way to win a football game. Absolutely. And they made it work. This is Concordia football, though. This is how they play. This is how they've played. Um, This is the same team two years ago that had a fullback go viral because he wore a neck roll and wore like number 38 and made all conference honorable mention. Like this is what they do at Concordia. And it works a lot of the time. Um, Like I said, it's big for them to pull off this kind of win. And that kind of sets Dort up to be alone at the top of the G pack, which is something. Yep. They've been up there, but they, they've never had that step on both boarding side and Northwestern, which they have right now. They still have to beat them, though. 100%, and that sets us up to talk about our pick for the game of the week this week, that being the number one squad in the country, Kaiser. They survive against number six, St. Thomas. Matchup of uh, two of the best teams in Florida, my man. 31-27, Seahawks come out on top. 
yeah, uh, Kaiser proving once again they are the best team in the country. Score, I don't want to say it's deceiving because St. Thomas did mount a legitimate comeback and they looked good doing it in this game. But it should be noted that Kaiser was out to a decent lead before St. Thomas started to build back into it. Um, but man, it is, it's very rare that you come out of a game feeling like both teams uh, have more positives than negatives, like even for the losing team. But it really felt like St. Thomas established themselves as a legitimate playoff contender. Anytime you can get within striking distance of Kaiser, it's impressive. Kaiser has just been absolutely blowing people out this year. And that's what they usually do in the regular season. For So for St. Thomas to, to come out and put up the fight that they did, it's it's extremely impressive. And I think, too, in this one, it was fun to see Shea Spencer and Keeley Watson, uh, the quarterbacks for either of these teams, going at it, combining for three touchdowns. Uh, Shea Spencer had 270 on the day. Keely Watson having 235 to his name. It was it's a fun time to watch some offensive football. Yeah, man, you look at the first quarter of this one and you see it. St. Thomas, they receive the opening kickoff and fumble it. And you give the ball over right away to start things off. And then it only gets worse, I think, from there on out. 24-3 to after the first quarter against the number one team in the country. There were a lot of people out there that obviously not outwardly would do this, but they might pack it up, like right, kind of right there and right then. Uh, this squad, a lot of fight in them. They outscore Kaiser 24-7 to in the second half and made things very interesting late, but uh, ultimately just a little bit too little too late for this uh, for this St. Thomas squad. Like you said, though, it's hard to do silver linings a lot of the time. I think this is one of those games where you can certainly go through and pull out a couple of those. Yeah, for sure. I should also note that for Kaiser in this game, Jaden Meisinger would get injured, which is a big blow to their backfield. He is the starting running back for them. Um, yep. Obviously, Andrew Burnett would do a good job picking up the slack. He is the second head to the two-headed monster in the backfield, so he did just fine. He had 100-plus yards on the day and a good day on the ground. But I do want to note something I feel like I don't get to talk a lot about with Kaiser receiving. They had a great day. Uh, Ref uh, Refeno Ben Gates. I totally botched that, but it's fine. Um, four catches for 142 yards and two touchdowns on the day. Usually that's the number being put up by a tight end for Kaiser or running back on the ground for them. Um, doing an absolutely great job through the air. Shea Spencer, obviously, back at the helm for that team. And uh, St. Thomas also had David Hayes, who had eight receptions, 143 yards at a touchdown. Him and uh, Keely Watson have been a fantastic connection through the air this year. And on that Meisinger note, I think that's that's important too as, as someone who you know has gone through a bunch of surgeries on my end. He went through three major knee injuries in his high school playing days, and that was something I was mm -hmm. reading up on a little bit earlier. So really hoping it's not one of those cases that uh, something was re-injured. Again, I didn't see it. Live, I don't. I didn't see the play or anything. I don't know exactly what happened, but just hoping um, because we're just a fan of him and that squad that hopefully it's not something where uh, something of that nature was re-aggravated or made yeah. worse. And sometimes with knees and those joints, man, there is almost nothing you can do to like prevent the further injury. It's not like strengthening a muscle. The ligaments cannot be reinforced they can only do it so yeah. much i've got rebar <laughs> running down my entire leg because of it so uh there's a lot of stuff you can do but man it's tough and, and you talk about burnett uh obviously picking up the load as the rb1 over there for the seahawks but that is an entirely different dynamic for them now and that's going to change the way their offense goes down the field and that can be a good thing maybe they find someone else who can supplement him out of the offensive backfield but that someone is also not going to be Jaden Meisinger. Yeah, for sure. Um, don't know the severity of Meisinger's injury, so obviously hoping the best for him, like <laughs> like you said, Kobe. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they have a third guy in the rotation because Andrew Burnett kind of came out of nowhere last year. So I, who knows? Maybe they just make a factory of these guys down there in Florida. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but no matter the case, I'm feeling pretty good about both these teams leaving this game. Kaiser uh, establishing themselves as the top dog off of an impressive defensive effort. Anytime you can hold Ron Tavis Farmer to under 100 yards rushing, it is a great day for your defense. So Yeah, we've talked a lot about the other offensive backfield, but that's that's a good note because we uh, he's been honored in some of our Player of the Week stuff, I think, through the past like season or two, and, and that's that's a hard, hard area to crack. There are some ridiculous stat lines that, uh, that come in every week for that. But let's talk a game that was a lot more one-sided, that being Indiana Wesley, and they dominate St. Xavier, number four versus number 13 in a game that was all Wildcats. Dude, I guess both these teams are big cats, but uh, technically SXU is the Cougars, correct? 
Yes, correct. Uh, but the Wildcats would be the mm. top cat of the night in yep. this one. Very handily, uh, I uh, Indiana Wesleyan, excuse me, sending a message to the rest of the NAI, basically with a giant middle finger saying like, hey, we're we're common man like like what colorado says man that's that's what we're running with uh hopefully with more wins i at this point more wins in colorado but uh um off the back of an incredible uh quarterback performance from kyle uh uh antony 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 okay. i think that's how you say that yeah you say um, it a fourth time maybe you'll get it you know yeah okay i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna re-say that <laughs> I had it. Dude, I prepped that one too. That's the fucked up part. Um, okay. Ant- Antony. I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah, no, you're good. No, I love it, dude. I'm looking at this one and going through the, the box score here, man. You talk about this Indiana Wesleyan defense, especially at home, though. But, uh, man, you look at this number 95 yards of total offense allowed for this Cougar offense. That is is incredible 21 on the ground 74 through the air indiana wesleyan ran for 95 yards it wasn't exactly an offensive performance from the ground game but when you throw for 440 a lot of those things can get covered up and that seems to be the identity we're seeing from this uh, idub squad yeah um stuart ross who has been around the st xavier program for a while uh known for being a good passer 13 for 18 on the day 71 yards in an interception and he was sacked seven Yep. times not not an ideal day uh if you're if you're Stuart there uh kyle uh antony i'm gonna say that right this time oh yeah uh went 31 for 45 through the air 395 yards and two touchdowns i mean that is that's a one-sided quarterback battle if i've ever seen one um isaac smith on the day for indiana wesley and also having 10 catches for 114 yards and ryan whitwell with four catches 76 yards and two touchdowns uh, all that to say that St. Xavier still had a decent statistical day on the defensive side of the ball. Obviously, the offense, there wasn't much to note there. But Chris Swain and Ryan Fitzgerald uh, mounting the linebacker room for the Cougars there. Uh, Swain had 15 tackles, half a tackle for loss, two pass breakups. And Fitzgerald had 14 tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, a sack, and a forced fumble on the day. And this wasn't a case of St. Xavier going down. And sometimes you'll see teams that sustain these long drives throughout the entirety of the field, get into the red zone and then sputter out. Or maybe uh, that bag of tricks becomes a lot lighter and a lot smaller because of the limited kind of field positioning or whatever. They only Mm -hmm. had one trip into the actual red zone throughout the entirety of this one. We're not able to capitalize on that trip. And this was just a classic case of not running enough plays. Your defense is out there for far too long. Yep. And for a team that wasn't rushing the ball predominantly in Indiana Wesleyan, they still dominated time possession 33 and a half minutes, which when you're throwing the ball at that clip typically isn't kind of the way things go. So really for me here, it was a lot of three and outs for this uh, SXU offense, three of 13 on that critical down. And that when you can't sustain drives at all, that's going to be the recipe for uh whatever the opposite of success is, right? And it wasn't the case also. They're not turning the ball over a ton through the air on the ground, and there wasn't the four interceptions like we talked about earlier in the Concordia game. None of these crazy things that jump off the box score, but it was just a consistent effort from this Indiana Wesleyan defense that uh, quite literally just kept them off the field. Yeah, that's how you know it's a dominant performance because Indiana Wesleyan controlled so much of this game that there's nothing that jumps out as like, oh, this is the exact reason. Like Indiana Wesleyan on all fronts just was dominant um and they look as good as anybody i've been i've been questioning this indiana wesleyan team i don't know how good they are uh haven't known i've been kind of down on them compared to the national media but man i gotta i might need to to shut my mouth a little bit because this is a really that's what we call kicking the ass yeah absolutely Speaking of kicks in the ass, the Southern Oregon squad that we have talked at nauseum about Uh, uh, on this program, more cannibalism out west, Montana Tech. You want to talk about kicked in the ass, dude? It is me keeping up with the Frontier Conference every week. God. (laughs) 42-35, Montana Tech takes this one. Both these teams have been incredibly exciting to watch. I would love nothing more than to go out to, is it Butte? I'm yes. trying to think of the actual city, yes. but to go out and catch one of these order games, that place looks electric, and all of these it's games electric. are insane. Yes, this is, dude, it, it just means more in D1 for the SEC. It just means more in the frontier, dude. These oh, fans yeah. are are rabid, 
rabid. Uh, it's it's incredible. It, it's so fun to watch. But yeah, Montana Tech getting it done again. And should be noted, they do face Montana Western next week. Yes. And what I'm sure will confuse us even more about this conference. I cannot wait. Um, excited for that test for them next week. But man, uh, just an incredible day for Montana Tech. And this was... Montana Tech was pretty in control of this game from the jump. They would trade blows with Southern Oregon for a good chunk of this game, uh, but they would have a 41 to 21 lead in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. Southern Oregon would mount a comeback, but too little, too late. I Montana Tech just from the jump knew what they were doing. It was off the back of some pretty good offensive performances like we've seen from Blake Thielen, 17 for 22 225 yards, two touchdowns. Landers Smith, the guy, another guy we've talked a lot about, uh, 94 yards on the ground, two touchdowns on the day. On the Southern Oregon side, Gunnar Yates is still playing like the best player in the country with 139 rushing yards and yep. three touchdowns, 7.3 average on the day. Oh, and not to mention, he uh, also was their second leading receiver with a touchdown through the air and 78 yards receiving as well. That is ridiculous. Ooh. Shout out to uh, Montana Sports on YouTube for the highlights I just played right there. And you look at this one, two really high-powered offenses, which you could tell by just looking at the actual score itself. But I think a more telling stat is out of nine trips combined in the red zone, 100% success rate in scoring and finishing those drives. And, and two teams, too, that the defenses are no slouch. You're not playing, yeah. uh, you know, Little Sisters of the Poor or whatever the, the analogy that some people like to make. Like, these defenses are very stout in their own right, and so their ability yep. to finish like that was uh, was very impressive. Three of three combined on fourth down. You're looking at about 60% combined on third down. Like, these are all margins that are really good offensive metrics. Time of possession, very similar for both these squads. And at the end of the day, I think you you kind of mentioned it. Montana Tech able to get kind of an upper hand earlier on. And when you're playing really a good, good competition, excuse me, it's tough to come back from that. When you have to overcome a multi-score deficit, when the other team doesn't just lay down and stop scoring. So uh, I think that was probably the difference in this one. That's probably the most layman's yeah. way of, of talking about football I may have talked about in a while. But this is, uh, like you said, another week of confusion, madness, and excitement. Yeah, absolutely. And not to mention, like, this Montana Tech team also has knocked off Georgetown this year, if we recall, um, a team that I was really high on going into the season. And they have looked really good. But, like I said, the day of reckoning comes for all Frontier teams. And they're playing Montana Western next week. So they better – they got to be careful, man. Um, should be fun, though, seeing how the rest of this conference shakes out. No, I agree with you, and I think something that's really impressive about this team that we haven't talked about as much, we obviously talked about the win uh, for the College of Idaho last week in overtime over the Ore Diggers, 45-37, and mm -hmm. for both teams in a conference like this where you talk about emotional wins and losses and games that mean so much and games that come down to the wire like that, it can be very difficult to get up for each game every week. I'd be curious to hear from some of the guys that play in this conference, because maybe not a, a, as good of a question for you and I, but is that easier because every team that you play has a number in front of it? Or is it more difficult because every game means that much more? And if you don't come out on top, it's like a little piece of you is just ripped out and left on that field. Like that's gotta be, I would yeah. imagine one or the other. Um, but then again, you're, you're playing the number seven and now number eight team in the country in back-to-back -back weeks. I don't imagine the motivational talk pregame has to be too elaborate. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to get up for games, but I imagine with how emotional these conference games are, it's it's going to be a lot uh, for them to handle emotionally. Should also note, Carroll College, kind of an unsung winner of this week after all that chaos in the frontier. Yep. Should be noted, Montana Tech and uh, Carroll College will collide for the second time this year. First time in conference play. Yeah. You heard me correctly. Uh, they did not play in conference at the beginning of the year. Um probably for a spot at the top of the frontier uh obviously we have quite a few weeks to go till then but something to look out for carol's definitely a team to watch through all of this frontier madness um seeing how they kind of shuffle in all of this dude that could be a t-shirt right there what's that frontier madness Frontier Madness. We're going to have to incorporate it. that. I love that. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that November 16th matchup is going to be is gonna be a big one. And you talked about it. They played earlier on September 7th in week two, or really week one, quote-unquote, uh, yep. of the season. And the GLIAC here in D2 actually has done that before when they were down a few members the last couple of years where you'd play a team early on and it wouldn't count towards your conference slate and then get them on later in the year. And 
that's an interesting dynamic, right? It'd be very curious to see, one, how a football team changes from that week zero, week one, all the way to like a week 11 type of deal towards the For end of sure. the season. And you're going to have different personnel available. You're going to have grown into your different schemes and have some guys playing some more meaningful snaps. But also, you've played the team before. You, you probably yeah. know a little bit more of what to expect and how to handle them. And then I think maybe a bigger part of it uh, – as well is the first game was on the road they pick up the win this one's going to be in butte on november 16th so that could be uh kind of a deciding factor in that one as well for sure and this is actually for the frontier this is a they play teams twice a year less often now with the schedule because yeah. simpson is now in the conference yep. so this is actually like probably a breath of fresh air for them they're like oh we only have to play one team twice that's great usually they got to cycle through a few times which is usually where all the chaos ensues from but clearly they are jumping the gun um because I don't know what to make of this conference, and I will say that probably until they are all either knocked out of the playoff or one of them wins the national championship. So, <laughs> I don't know. Other games worth mentioning here. Baker had a scare versus Missouri Valley. Scored 23 unanswered, dude. They win 26-16, but that one did not start off in the fashion that maybe people had expected. Missouri Valley has had a, kind of a... Uh, tumultuous season is maybe a good way of putting it, but uh, Baker does yeah. end up coming out on top. I believe they're about number 20 in the current yep. NAI poll. The current NAI poll has Baker right now at number 19. Okay. So they, they've actually moved up a spot after that effort Hello. last week. Um, but man, yeah, this is, you got to win your stinkers. Like it's, it's important <laughs> to do in football. But it's 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 a rough look for Baker, who has already stumbled along the way a little bit. I still think they're a very quality football team. Obviously, a lot of things can happen within a game, but being able to rattle off twenty three unanswered against any team's a great sign. So, being able to get it done, uh, good for them. Curious to see what this means for the rest of their year. Yeah. 100%. A team that we've talked a little bit about on this show, maybe not enough. They're 6 and 0 now, the Campbellsville Tigers, dude. Undefeated yeah. still, 27-14 win over Cumberland, dude. This is a this is a pretty exciting squad and uh, the tweet that I saw from uh, one of the coaches on the staff, this uh, kind of aerial shot of the drone a view of the stadium, a great atmosphere, mm -hmm. a sweet press box. Coach Allwood says recruits, listen, you want to play in front of this crowd. And that place it, it does certainly fit the bill. I think from an aerial perspective, when it comes to the NAI scene, this place looks legit. And there were a couple other great kind of game day atmosphere shots I wanted to share. But yeah, dude, at the end of the day, the squad is six and zero, oh, and they've beaten actually some pretty competent teams to get there. This has not been a cakewalk uh, for this Campbellsville squad. You start things off opening the year against Pikeville, and that was a one point victory over mm -hmm. that squad. And then uh, some games against Weber International, Union College that kind of went their way. But again, some more quality opponents in Bluefield University that we know has not been a pushover historically, been a fringe kind of top 25 type team. Roosevelt mm -hmm. University, new to the D2 scene that uh, I think has actually, you know, without winning a game has actually been one of the most impressive winless teams in the country Roosevelt has. And now you go and you beat a Cumberland squad in the start of Mid-South play that seems like it could be a really statement win. Now, you look down the down the barrel here, and you've got some big ones coming up. You know what I <laughs> yeah, mean? Uh, Lindsey Wilson is kind of disappointed, but they're still very much a good squad. And the Bethels and Georgetowns and Cumberlands down the line. There's some. There's still some teams there, but 6-0 uh, and oh is 6-0, and oh, my friend. Mm -hmm. Going into the bye week, being able to rip off six consecutive, and now you get some time off to heal up a little bit and True. recoup for for basically what's going to be the gauntlet. Uh, Cumberland is a very solid quality team that they beat. Uh, probably metrics have Cumberland is like a top 40 team right now, mm -hmm. so not a slouch by any means. But, I mean, you after the, the bye week, you have to come out ready to go because you got Lindsey Wilson. Faulkner, after that, you should be able to win, but then it's down the barrel against Bethel. Uh, on the road and then you host Georgetown and then you are on the road to close the year against Cumberlands who has also been a good team traditionally yeah which I just it, realized as we were talking I knew they were separate teams but literally Cumberland and Cumberlands and that was uh oh I brain did yeah. a little bit of a flip there yeah. I can't say I blame you yeah. uh because that happens a lot that's the absurd. way I remember it Cumberland was the team that lost to Georgia Tech 222 to zero uh, and that fun trivia question and Cumber Lens is the the Patriots. <laughs> I don't no know. I just re I, correlation. I, I, no correlation. I just remembered the the Georgia Tech score that I'm like, oh, Patriots, uh, Patriots. and Phoenix, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that so, is outrageous, I and I don't, I don't know if that's football standard. trivia now because of that. Yeah, dude, where where would you be without me for your for your trivia of the day? That could right? be a new section on um, what's it called? Trivia crack. You know, you spin the wheel, <laughs> dude. That's obscure a NAI football Holy scores. Cow. Oh, yeah. I they just need to hire me for that. <laughs> It'd be great. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot about this Campbellville's uh, Campbellsville team coming up. Um, and like you said, it's a great environment. All the Mid South takes football really seriously. They all love it down there in that Kentucky area. So it's uh, it's fun to see them up and at them challenging this this big three at the top of the Mid South that we usually see. So, Amen, brother. I appreciate you, Matt. Have a good rest of your week, my man. Looking forward to another talk uh, a week from now. Yeah, sounds good, man. Take it easy. See ya.